Well, good morning. I know that we're getting old, so we need closed captioning. So let me tell you what he said. Uh, basically, he said, the reason I tested you so much is because I knew you'd be ready for this time. And the reason you went through this, and the coach didn't tell him. Now, I don't know why the coach didn't tell him ahead of time, hey, I'm working on you, but I guess it wouldn't have worked. And I don't know what season you're in of life, but we all go through a season of life where we're disappointed. We're either disappointed with our circumstance, we're maybe disappointed with our health. You know, we exercise and do all kinds of things, and then we tear something or pull something or break something or, right? Get, getting there, some of you more than others, right? And uh, when we look at the story of Easter, you know, we love to talk about the resurrection and the awesome things that happen, but there are things that we don't do well with. And I'm going to talk about a few things today. I stole my son's bag. Don't tell him. So I'm going to talk about Gatorade today. And talk about, uh, talk about ironing. But we talk about the most important thing. I think most men in here can relate to me if I could get a couple of manly grunts when I show you this. If you, you would help me out, that'd be great. Here we go. Ready? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is a programmable remote. And it uh, doesn't work for Stepford wives. But, uh, but by the way, Rodney, between you looking so awesome and Mike Minot, the coolest person on earth, sharing the message focus last night, I'm like... I don't think, I, I'm, we're going to have to raise the cool points. Maybe I need a different stage, a different place to stand, Dave, because of that. So, I don't know if you've ever done this with the remote, but I have, where you get the remote out and you push to turn on the TV, and the TV doesn't turn on. You go, oh, man. So you think, well, maybe I'm not holding the remote right. So you kind of point it back at the TV, and you're like, oh, it's not working. So then you actually have to get up. You move towards the TV, and you push the button, and you're like, what? In the world, you start, you're thinking, oh, the TV's crashed. You go, you unplug the TV, still doesn't come on. You go, you change the batteries in the remote, you push it, it's not working. And then your wife says, hey, that's the wrong remote. <laughs> Anybody had that happen? See, we love control, and we love things we can control. It's why we love Alexa, right? So we can say to Alexa, turn on a thing, order me this, do this for me, do that for me. TV remote, a commercial comes on, forget that, right? Let's see what other 42 shows I can watch at the same By the way, how many of you honestly watch more than one show at a time? No, you don't? Oh, okay. These are, the ones who raise their hands are my friends. You other people, I don't know. And you got to watch something about trucks and fishing in ice and fixing up a house all at the same time. Just to make sure you're well balanced in your life. So here's what I know about control. Control works great. Okay, it never does. And the biggest thing, if you have an office, one of the things I think you ought to do, Billy, maybe you want to, Bill, maybe you want to try this. And uh, uh, anytime somebody starts at your office, make it so the printer will not work for them. Because if you want to see people's personality, let them push print and it tell you it's sending and not. You, you talk to the printer, you bargain with the printer, you scream at the printer or whatever you need to do, right? And so today I want to talk about this idea of how Sometimes we can even become disappointed with God because of our expectations, how we think we should be in control. And then sometimes we're confused about life and the way things should go. And today I want to talk about this idea of learning to obey and believe. And especially during the ironing times of life. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So let's look about truths about Christ's reign in us today. And uh, this whole series, we're looking at John 3.16, which says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for you and me. So we're talking about God's love, God's love reigning in us. So let's look at three things today. Number one, wrong expectations lead to frustrations. Here we go. Matthew 27, 37 to 44, very familiar passage about what Christ did for us. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Two rebels, some places it says robbers or thieves, were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. And if you were one of the disciples, or if you were Mary, or if you were somebody that was there, that, that knew that Jesus was who he said he was, you would have said also, yeah, 
Like, do that. Like, if you'll do that, everybody will know it's who you are. I mean, God, if you would just answer my prayer the way I want you to answer it, then I'll believe in you. If you would just do this for me, then I would believe. If you would just do things the way I want you to, then I'll believe. And then it continues. By the way, just a little side note here. The thief on both sides of him, what the Romans did back then is they hung people in groups. And so if you were thieves with somebody, you would be hung with their fellow thieves. And so many people think that Jesus' cross was actually meant for Barabbas. And Barabbas got off, and here his buddies were still there going, wait a second, he was the ringleader. What are we doing here? Life isn't fair. It continues, you're going to destroy the temple. And it says, come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. By the way, the same thing Satan said to Jesus, if you're the Son of God, do this. If you're the Son of God, do these things. Let me rub the magic lamp, right, if I say the right words. In the same way, the chief priest and teacher of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Time out. Just a few days earlier, they had said, hey, he raised Lazarus from the dead, and now everybody's coming after him. Let's not only kill Jesus, let's take Lazarus out too. And that was their plan. And so here they're like, okay, now we got you. So they're mocking him. Let him come down from the cross, and then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Now, I want to tell you how weird I am. I know that doesn't take long. Some of you haven't been to church here in a while. You're like, wow, they let him be the pastor. If you haven't said that at least once in the last six weeks... You'll start today. Because this is how weird I am. My wife says, hey, there's a new movie out. Let's watch it. It's about a dog. And I go, what? It's about a what? It's about a dog. I said, hang on just a second. I Google the movie. And I write these words. Does the dog die? If it says dog dies, I look at my wife and go, we're not watching that movie. She said, why are we not watching it? Because the dog dies. Recently, we were watching a movie that had a dog in it. My wife knew I was watching it. And during one part of the movie, you think the dog dies. And she looks over at me, and I think she instantly realized, oh, wait a second. He's watching the movie. The dog's going to live. And she was right. Listen, as much as I'm thankful for the sacrifice of Christ, nobody liked this. Nobody said this is a great time of life. What did we want? We wanted control. We wanted Jesus to do what we wanted him to do. I mean, he raised others. Why can't he raise himself? Hey, if I'm a thief on a cross, I'm yelling, hey, uh, save yourself. This is what one of the thieves says. Save yourself and us. By the way, one of those thieves turned to Christ, and we're going to show you kind of what happened in the background a little later. But they were surprised. And you ever pray and say, you know what, God? If you just tell me what you're up to, if you just tell me, like, like, I'm dealing with this situation right now. If you would just tell me what that's for, then, you know, I'll be okay. Or if you just tell me I'm going to be okay on the other side of this, then it would be okay. But I want to show you all through the Bible this happens, where God literally tells people what's going to happen, and they do like husbands do for honeydews. Pay no attention at all. I'll get around to that. You don't have to remind me every six months, right? Right? Luke 9, 22, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, which you see in this one passage. And he must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. I mean, if they had Google, they could have searched, Is Jesus going to make it at the end of this movie? He looked them in the face and said, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to be resurrected. And they all went, Phew. they didn't remember it at all. They didn't remember what was going to happen. Why? Because they wanted Jesus to do what they want to do. They thought they were going to reign. And here's what I want you to know. Listen, when you let Christ reign in your life, here's what you realize. You ready? This isn't heaven. And you don't have the remote. You don't get to, I would love it if you could fast forward through difficulties. Like this is a tough time. 
oh, I'm so glad. That... Now, when we look back, we're like, well, I'm glad I made it through that. But when we're going through it, what do we think? Am I going to make it through this? How am I going to do it? What's next? And we don't have control. But when love reigns and Christ reigns in our heart, what do we do? We say, God, you have the remote. I don't understand it, but I trust you. Number two, confusion leads to wrong conclusions. Yes, I did very rhymey today. How many of you like Gatorade? Okay, okay. Let's try that again because you guys are shy. I, um, I, I know some of you grew up Baptist, so this is as far as your arms go up. But uh, <laughs> if you grew up Presbyterian, my sister-in-law told me she went to a Presbyterian church and then she went to a Baptist church and she said, you know what the biggest difference between a Presbyterian church and a Baptist church was? She said, in a Presbyterian church, the deacons stood out front and smoked like this. And at the Baptist church, they put the cigarette behind their back. I said, oh, that's awesome. That's what she told me. I don't know whether it's true or not. You have to talk to her. But let me tell you about Gatorade. So I have a friend. His name is Tim Goff. A great guy. He's been my friend for 20-something years. Tim went and helped his mother-in-law move, which is a sainthood-worthy activity. Went up to Arkansas with his son, helped his, his uh, mother-in-law move, and stacked uh, the furniture in a truck, and they drove home. As they were driving home, Tim kept saying to his son, I am so thirsty. So his son would pull over, get gas, go in and get a whole thing of Gatorade. And Tim just started chugging Gatorade, chugging. And the more Gatorade he drank, the thirstier he got. Just more and more Gatorade, just drinking Gatorade all the way home. He gets home and his son looks over and he is unconscious. His son takes him to the hospital and his blood sugar did not register on their meter until they did a later blood test. It was off the charts. Literally, he was now in a, you ready for this? Diabetic coma. And he didn't know he was diabetic. And the worst thing you can do as a diabetic when you're starting to have problems with your sugar is drink sugar. And all the way home, he guzzled sugar. It actually got to where he's in the hospital, and they came and told us he wasn't going to make it. They did a brain scan, came in, and I was there when the doctor said to his wife, we see no brain activity. To which what I wanted to say was, that's always been true. Don't worry about that. But that's not what I said. Instead, I told her he's going to be okay, because I just really felt like he was. A few days later, he woke up. I've got a picture of him in a hospital bed going... Not only did he wake up, he put his glasses on after having this diabetic coma and his glasses, everything looked blurry and he took his glasses off and everything was clear. His vision improved. That's bizarre. But here's the deal. Yeah, so don't do this for your sight. Okay, please don't. No diabetic comas. Gatorade doesn't heal you, right? Okay, but here's the thing. That whole time he was thirsty, listen, for the wrong thing. He was looking for this to quench him. Some of us think, if I just had the answers, if I just knew what was coming next, if I just understood more, then I would be satisfied. And we keep thinking more, 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 and we can't figure out why we're still thirsty. Listen to what it says in this passage. So in Luke 24, the women go out to the tomb. The angel's there. I love the one passage that talks about the angel rolls the stone away and then sits on it. I think that's awesome. It says this. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men, that's talking about the angel, said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. And then the angel says this. I love this. Remember how he told you? While he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day raised again. It was like the angels were listening into that conversation, writing it down. Apparently, they're like Google for God, right? What did he say? Right? And then they continue. Then they remembered his words. 
When they came back from the tomb, what did they do? They told all these things to the 11 and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. And I love this. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. And this is the only time that this word is used in the Bible. It was a medical term for when you basically have gotten hit in the head and you're loopy. And so they're looking at the women like, ooh, did that rock hit you? Like, what? They had no idea why. They so wanted to reign with Jesus. Remember, at the Lord's Supper, they said, hey, which side can we sit on, you know, when you get on the throne? And they thought the throne was going to be right there. They missed the whole point. Because they were so busy wanting what they wanted, they missed what God had already shown them. You know what? I think sometimes God is revealing to us what he wants us to know, but we're so busy wanting something else that we don't pay attention to the blessing right here because we're so busy paying attention to what we don't like over here. The disciples, listen, the disciples were so busy paying attention to what they didn't like that they couldn't even hear the very thing that would have blessed them. Sometimes you and I are so busy thinking about the thing we don't like in our life, that thing that didn't turn out the way we wanted it to. Sometimes mistakes we've made, we're so focused on those things that we don't pay any attention to the blessing right now. What's really cool is on this very day, uh, a thief on the cross went to heaven. And so I've got a pastor that you're going to see who gives a little background. It's about a two-minute video. Without the preaching of the cross, without preaching the cross to ourselves all day and every day, we will very, very quickly revert to faith plus works as the ground of our salvation. So that to go to the old uh, Fort Lauderdale question, if you were to die tonight and, and, and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer that, and if I answer it in the first person, we've immediately gone wrong. Because I, because I believed, because I have faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. Loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person, because he, because he. Think about the thief on the cross. What an immense... I can't can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you 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 were cussing the guy out with your friend. You'd never been in a Bible study. You never got baptized. You, never, you didn't know a thing about church membership. And, and, yet, and yet, you made it. You made it. How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said. You know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What, what do you mean you don't know? Well, because like, I don't know. Well, you know, we, uh, uh, did you, Excuse me, let me get my supervisor. Then go get the supervisor ranger. So, we have just a few questions for you. First of all, are you, are, you, are, you, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? The guy said, I've never heard of it in my life. And, and what about, let's just go to the doctrine of scripture immediately. This guy's just staring. And eventually in frustration, he says, on, on what basis are you here? And he said, The man on the middle cross said, I can come. (laughs) Now, now, that's the, that is the only answer. So here's the thing. You know, we so often think that our behavior is whether God really loves us or not. If I am good enough. If my good outweighs my bad, if, if somehow I do enough good things, then maybe God will love me. Listen, God absolutely loves you. And here's the cool thing about John 3, 16. It says, God so loved the world. That was before Jesus came. God loved you in your sin when you were messed up. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners. And so what makes the difference? Jesus made it very clear in John 14, 6 and 7. He said this, I am the way, the truth, 
and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you'd know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And so well, this comes out of a conversation where Thomas says, uh, Jesus, uh, how can we get to where you're going? We don't really know the way. And then Jesus says to him, I'm the way. It's me. It's not about you. It's not about your works. It's not about how many good things you do. It's not about how much money you give to the church, which really messes it up for me. Right? Right? Because if I could, I'd be like, you know what? If you really want to make it. Right? And so the truth is, what is it about? It's about putting our faith in Christ Jesus. I trust you to take care of me. Because he was either a lunatic, as C.S. Lewis says, because he said, I'm the way to heaven and I am God. And it's like, what? Or he was a liar, trying to deceive people. By the way, none of the disciples ever, they, they went to their deaths still confessing that he was the way, the truth, and the life. Or, number three, C.S. Lewis says he was who he said he was. And so here's the thing. When you let Christ reign, you look to Jesus to fill your thirst. Not your works not getting everything right, not trying to be, you know, I got to be this super person. I got this list like Ben Franklin had, you know, I got this list and I'm going to work on this list. And then if I get this right, then maybe God will love me. And we're trying to quench our thirst when the truth is we are spiritual diabetics. And what we need is his grace. My wife would love it if I said the insulin of his grace, but I won't. So we're going to talk about, we talked about wrong expectations. We talked about confusion. And then finally, obey and believe in order to receive. I love these with the... And here's the thing about ironing. I don't like ironing. I don't know if you like ironing. I don't like ironing. I have a spray that I spray my shirts with so that I don't have to use this. That's how lazy I am. I hate ironing. Does anyone here like to iron? Would you raise your hand? Because we're all going to send our ironing to you. Okay, thanks. All right. Carl, I saw your hand go up. Is he going to burn all my... He couldn't hear me. Is that what happened? Okay, so, so here's the thing. So, so truth be known, truth be known, I hate ironing. But most people don't like ironing. There's a few of you, but most of us don't. I had a friend, her name is Jennifer Thigpen. She is a phenomenal singer. I can remember when she was a teenager, I said to her, I went to her mom and I said, listen, you need to, she's phenomenal. You need to encourage her to do more with this. This is amazing how she can sing. And so she went to school, went to, went to school and got her degree. And then, and then she went to a group called Truth, if you never heard of them, travel with them. And then she began performing with a group called Women of Faith. You may or may have not heard of them, but millions of ladies every year went to Women of Faith. And she was one of the main people on the stage that sang every week until there was a change of leadership. And the next thing she knows, she's in the back. She's not supposed to be out front. She's still considered on the team. But they handed her an iron and said, you hire iron all the clothes of the people that are going out there on the stage. And so, you know what she did? She began ironing, but she wasn't happy about it. She began to say, well, what is this? What am I supposed to do? And one day her mom said, can, can you call and talk to her? So I called and talked to her and I said these things. I said, hey, so let me ask you a question. I know you're doing something you don't think you should be doing. Has God told you that you're supposed to do something else? I don't know. Has God shown you that you're supposed to leave there? I don't know. Are they going to have you iron forever? I don't know. I said, well, until you figure out what God wants to do, just do what you can where you're at and praise God in the meantime. So while you're doing a terrible thing, you can still be joyful. While you're doing something that you hate, you can still rejoice and thank God for the things in your life that are wonderful. By the way, we all have a few terrible things going on at any given time in our life, whether it's us or family members or the news <laughs> or politicians. <laughs> right? Everybody's got a few health issues, our own mental health sometimes, right? But we can rejoice in the middle of that. It wasn't too many months later that I got a call that the people who had switched leadership were now gone. And she was back out front singing again. But she had to go 
through the time of ironing. God puts all of us through a furnace, the Bible says. There's a time of purification, a time where we have to do things we don't like. And sometimes we think it's about the thing we're doing, but what it's really about is how we're going to act in the middle of that trial. Are we going to trust God and obey? John 20, 19 to 23, on the evening of that very first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. By the way, uh, you know why Jesus said, peace be with you? Because Jesus suddenly appeared in a room. I mean, if we were sitting here and a random person all of a sudden just went, boo, we would all go, oh, right? And then they'd go, peace be with you. I don't think it works that quick, by the way. My staff knows not to walk up on me because I'm jumpy. So if I got headphones on or something, you better start throwing stuff from across the room. Right? I'm jumpy. And if you, if you came in and said, hey, Eric. And I went, oh, oh, and then you said, peace be with you. It didn't work. All right? So Jesus shows up, says, peace be with you. And then he continues. After he said this, what did he do? He showed him his hands inside. He said, hey, this is who I am. The disciples, listen, were overjoyed. When they saw the Lord, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I love this. If you forgive anyone their sins, they're forgiven. If you don't, they're not. I love that. Like, I don't know if I'm going to forgive your sins. What's awesome is what the disciples knew is how much they had been forgiven. And they knew we all needed to be forgiven. So what does Jesus do when they're in the Lord's Supper? One of the things he prays for is not only the disciples, but he prays for us. And what does he pray for us? That we would be full of the love of Jesus. Listen to this in John 20. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that's not it. Then listen to this. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. So when life is terrible, and when you're going through something that's not fair, and when you see something that's so tragic, you think, how could that happen? You say, God, I'm just going to praise you in the middle of this difficulty, in the middle of this trial, in the middle of this struggle. So let me ask you this question. What in your life right now is the iron? What's the thing in your life right now that's just difficult? If you were honest, you'd say, God, I'm disappointed that you haven't fixed that. Whatever it is, I want to encourage you. Hey, be faithful to what God has called you to do. Be obedient and say, God, would you fill my life with your love? If you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you today to begin to ask this question. God, are you real? I remember talking to an atheist years ago. And they were talking to me about God, which was kind of funny. I'm like, well, you're an atheist. They don't believe in God. And they said, but I, but I wonder if I should. And I said, I'll tell you what. Why don't you pray to the God you don't believe in and say, God, if you're real, would you show me that you're real? I said, now listen, you don't, it's not rubbing a genie's lamp. You don't ask God to kill somebody you don't like. Or make all the lights green. Although I've prayed that, right? But you say, God, you show me the way you want to show me that you're real. If you're here today and you're not a believer, I encourage you to pray that same prayer. He is a God who is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. If you really want to know if God is real, if you're earnest about that, I encourage you to begin to say, you know what, God, if you're real, would you show me that you're real? Would you verify to me that you are who you say you are? If you're here today and you want to give your life to Christ, I'll be here after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. If you're watching online, you can also send me a note, an email, a text, whatever. Love to talk to you about becoming a Christian. If you're here today and you're a Christian, but the truth is the life has gone out of your life, hey, be faithful in the difficulty. Ask God to help you to be obedient, to praise Him in the storm. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time, this Easter morning. Lord, we look at the story of Easter and so much disappointment, so much dread, so much sadness, so much pain. And sometimes if we're honest, we look around and that's what we see in our lives. That's what we see in our world. But Father, I pray as believers, we'd be so full of your spirit that we would recognize even in the middle of the times of ironing and difficulty that we would just be obedient to you and praise you for all that you've done and are doing around us. 
Lord, thank you for the challenges you've taken us through. Thank you that you will take us through the next one. Lord, I pray for anyone today who doesn't know you yet, that today would be the day they begin to move towards you. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.